Thank you very much, everyone. So, uh, it's nice to be here. This is my first time giving a talk in this workshop. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so, I see that in the many of the sessions, talks uh, here and also elsewhere, uh, this, uh, during this conference, the, one of the common themes that are coming up all the time is that uh, how to achieve the open-endedness in a finite, simulated world. So, many keynote speakers and also the speakers in this session uh, kept bringing up that issue. So, uh, I don't think there's any the, uh, uh, you know, clear universal solution, but here the, this talk is about my own work, the, my own re very recent work, trying to provide some tangible, concrete examples of how to break the barrier of that finiteness curse coming from computer simulation. So the key word is a cardinality leap, and the first part is uh, fairly the standard mathematical arguments about how to discuss the number of possibilities and then what was the generalizable practical way to increase that number fundamentally. On the second half, we're going to, you know, I'm going to use some very simplistic toy model to illustrate the point. So that's the plan. Oh, I'm going to time myself. 20 minutes, right? OK, so I'm going to skip the first part here. Yeah, 19, yes. So as I said, <laughs> it's OK. So the key issue we'd like to address in this uh, work is the how to overcome the limited you know, possibilities in the finite uh, fitness landscape. So, um, so I'm mean, the artificial chemistry guy, like the, the Dave showed, so I really am the big fan of creating everything from bottom up and then they try to observe uh, you know, the emergent patterns uh, from the bottom up way. So this is the uh, basic framework I'm going to use, but also in the meantime, the breaking the limit of the finiteness actually requires, I, I strongly believe it requires you know, the using the higher order organization, higher level organization that are not quite commonly used. For example, if you develop the evolution of robots, you have individuals, and you always uh, assess the performance of the individual biped robots, how far they can walk. Right? But uh, I, I don't see uh, so many works are discussing the, what are the performance of the two robots working together, three robots, five robots, hundred robots, millions of robots, right? Should be evaluated the same way because we are embedded in the physical world. The physical world has enormous computational capacity, you know, something superior here, maybe down there, you know, she or he is the, evaluating the molecular behaviors, you know, the, the behavior of cells, the behavior of the individuals, all simultaneously. The performance evaluation taking place at a very, you know, much multiple levels at once. And uh, I don't think, you know, there is any established artificial life models that are actually trying to do that, right? So that's a key idea. Okay, so just quickly, the theoretical consideration for those who are not familiar with the set theory. So, or maybe, you know, just a you general know, picture. So this is a typical uh, picture of the evolutionary landscape in general. You have some kind of domain, and you have the performance measurement. And here, the, uh, the bottom, at the bottom, you have the, some, the square uh, illustrating the green color here. This is the domain of the possibility. So you can say, let's say, set S. And uh, my point, the first part of my talk is that the cardinality, or the size, or densities, or whatever you want to call, of this particular set S has a strong implication about the open-endedness, or lack thereof, of the evolutionary system. So for example, he, if the possibility is contrary finite, this is the obvious case, the open-endedness can ne never happen, because you can exhaust in a finite amount of time. So this is no brainer. You can also create contrary infinite uh, possibilities. This is the example of the contour set. You can go deeper and deeper and deeper, so you can have infinitely many possibilities here, but still, there is a procedure to count everything, right, in infinite amounts of time. So that means that every single point you identify in this possibility space can be reached in a finite amount of time, even though it might be very long. So if that possibility is the optimal solution, the evolution will eventually find it. You see? So, what about the uh, uncountably infinite possibilities? So this case really means that the uh, genetic space or phenotypic space, whatever you want to call, they are made of real numbers. And then obviously there is no way to enumerate all the real numbers. So this is technically really open-ended. There is no way for the evolution to exhaustively try all the possible uh, states. So this is obvious. So, so that means that uh, the open-ended evolution, uh, sorry, so I'm going to skip this one. So if 
the set uh, S is finite or even country infinite, uh, eventually open ended. If the process is open ended, it should exhaustively search all the possible states. And eventually, and ironically, it's going to hit the optimal one in a finite amount of time. So this is a really daunting co uh, conclusion. So now what? Okay, so in order to uh, solve that uh, issue, we can take several approaches. One is that, this is, about, by the way, it's perfectly fine. Let's accept it. But finite, but very large S is good enough for us. And I absolutely agree. Maybe the Earth is already finite, but we don't really have enough time to exhaustively search all the possible configurations. That's fine. Fair enough. The end of the story. Conversation ends here. Okay? The other approach might be, okay, maybe the possibility space might be really the continuous real val uh, valued states. Um, this is also possible, but uh, if you look at the real biological system, as Howard Patti mentioned this morning, the actual yeah. genetics are made of di uh, discrete symbols, so this is not quite what we are actually made of. And also, the continuous valued possibility space naturally leads to the very simplistic conclusion that the simple chaos, right, the chaotic attractor, you know, never repeats itself. Is that open-ended evolution? Based on this definition, it is. But we are not quite satisfied by that, right? So the question is, can we still stick to the discrete uh, symbolic representation as a baseline uh, uh, you know, possibility space, and yet we can, can, you, can we create infinite, literally uncountably infinite possibilities? So, so this is where, uh, you know, the third uh, different approach uh, comes in. So formation of higher order entities of S, uh, like a power set. But I, what I'm going to talk about is like, somewhat beyond power set. Uh, this actually solves the problem. Oh yes, let's do this. Right? So this is where I'm going to introduce this idea, cardinality leap. There might be other mathematical terms here, but this is what I came up. Essentially, you try to create a multi-set of the entities of the original set S. And this is it's a very quick and easy way to cause a fundamental leap in terms of the number of possibilities in the set. I'm going to show you. So, so here you go. So if you start the, from the finite, countably finite set, and if you consider how many different possibilities are there by creating a multi-set. Multi-set is, a, you know, there are more than the set. You can repeatedly choose the same entities as many times as you want, right? So the number of the each element can go from zero to infinity. So that means that even from the finite uh, set uh, of the symbols, you can still create a countably infinite set as a multi set. This is obvious because we are made of like 120 elements, but the combinations of atoms are infinite. That's the idea, right? And if the original uh, set was already countably infinite, by considering multi-set, you actually reach countably inf uh, uncountably infinite sets. So either way, if you consider the, the multi-set, the higher order structures, the cardinality jumps. I think this is a very this simplistic idea, but it could be implemented in many artificial life systems. And uh, some people are already using it. Uh, for example, the artificial chemistry models often use multi-set as a representation. That's one way. And also, in some sense, the Genetic representation used in genetic programming and some other uh, evolutionary computation use a tree structure. And if you allow those trees to go infinitely deep, that could also co correspond to the cardinality leap. Uh, so there are already examples here. Okay. So in a real biological systems, uh, there are full of such examples, such as the chemical elements forming the molecules. And this is really the cardinality leap from the atomic level to molecule level. And also, you can also consider the set of molecules, sorry, multi-set of molecules, like my cells or even the biological cells. You know, whenever you consider multi-sets of the original elements in the uh, set, uh, uh, possibility set S, you are seeing the cardinality leap. So this is beautiful. Okay, and then the question is, how can we do this in the real simulated world? And this actually brings us the big, big questions and technical challenge, as I mentioned. So, how can we design a universal mechanistic uh, me uh, methodology to evaluate uh, the, any kind of entities at any level? Like, we can, of course, evaluate individuals, 
we may be able to design the you know, performance of two individuals coupled together, maybe three individuals, but this is not the end of the story. We should be able to evaluate performances of any, literally any level of hierarchical organizations. So we don't have any clue how to do it. What about but, a LISP interpreter? Sorry? A LISP interpreter. You are getting close to what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, but somehow the real physics is doing that for, with no problem because you know, each entity is also the computational device in the physical world, right? So, in order to you know imitate this kind of universal multi-layer performance evaluation, we need to summon someone else, right? And in this case, I'm going to reach out to the some forbidden technique or black magic or Kabbalah or something. So here, you know, I'm going to basically disqualify myself as a modeler. Okay, I'm going to resort to hash function. Okay, so hash function is the god. You must agree. Right? It's a universal. You throw at hash function any kind of object, and it's going to give you some number, right? We will never understand how it works, but so so are we in terms of the physics, right? So here you have a reality. You create something, and it's he heavily embedded. The embedded the you know reality actually produces some kind of performance measure we have may or may not understand. And we are I'm I am just uh, replacing that physics universal physics with hash function. Okay, just to illustrate the, uh, how this kind of stuff could work. Okay, so here's actually the mechanistic uh, description model. So it's a really simple, simplistic artificial chemistry model. You have some continuous spatial domain. Each particle is really just atom. Uh, the number of atoms could be finite, like 100 or 1,000, but it's finite. It's a discrete. So the possibility set S is countably finite. Okay, and here, uh, instead of evaluating the single entities, what we're going to do is to choose any kind of higher order structure. It could be just a single particle, could be two particles, or three, or hundred, thousand, it doesn't matter. You just grab a subset of this physical reality and then throw this into hash function. Okay? And then this is God, so it can produce any kind of values, could be pretty much random, but you can convert that return value of hash function to the 0, 1, the you know, uh, numerical range, and you can just decide. Based on the, this return value, you could create a copy of this set, or you can just kill it, or you can just do nothing. That's a very simplistic idea, okay? And you can just keep randomly choosing any subset here and there, apply that hash function, and then repeat, all right? So that's the basic idea. So model itself is crazy simple, right? But, it's really simple, but uh, I think the fundamentally different aspect of this kind of model is that we are no longer bound, uh, bound to the single level or two levels or anything, right? As long as particles come together, there is no upper bound. You can grab any higher order structures and then evaluate its performance. So I would say this is kind of digital embeddedness, right? Or embodiment, whatever you want to call it, because we are using some... Uh, physics law that are not knowable to us, and then we are still using that reality, in this case it's a hash function, to evaluate the performance or the, you know, uh, the behavior of any higher order structure. Okay, now this is a detail, uh, you can read the details in my paper. So, this is how it looks like. And I can end quite quickly. Um, in this case, I haven't had a chance to run systematic simulation. This is only one anecdotal example, but I think this is enough. Okay? Well, just by looking at this, it doesn't look quite different from any uh, artificial chemistry models. Right? But you see, there are some adaptations going on already. Right? Certain types died off, certain colors are going to grow. But keep in mind, this is not about individual adaptation. The replication might be taking place at the three dot level or five dot level, or even hundred particle level. We don't know. We do have the data, but I haven't looked at it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. And gradually you start to notice that there are two contents or kingdoms here and there. Uh, it might be the individual performance-based kingdoms, but you start to see that the blue guys are gradually you know, fighting back. Right? Anyway, so you can run this simulation a whole bunch of times. One thing uh, which is very uh, expensive in this simulation is that the population density can go really high 
in a local uh, area so that this looks like it's an easy simulation, but it takes a lot of time to run this one simulation. Okay? So this is the, some visual uh, interest. And coming back to Dave's question, if you are presented this way, you know, can you identify individual? Well, this is a very difficult one. But fortunately, we are the ones who are simulating this. We can go back which units are being replicated. And here are some of the contents. Oh, sorry. So, first of all, you can just uh, measure some really simplistic plot. So here, for example, what are the return values coming from the application hash function? Well, there's nothing much. Initially, the poor performer is going to die off, and then the fitness quickly goes up. The blue is the average, red is the maximum. So the, if you look at the individual level, the adaptation goes quickly, and then after that, nothing happens. Okay? Here, this is the number of the replicated individual entities. So per unit of time, how many entities? Entities mean it could be a single particle, could be two, could be three. Any kind of combination of particles that succeeded in the replication, this is number. It also goes up and then kind of plateaus. Okay, so far, not so much. But if you look at the, what are the actual units of self-replication, uh, you know, uh, uh, succeeding in replication, if you plot this over time, so this is the maximum number of, en uh, hold on one second. Yes, maximum number of entities in each replication event. So that means that, you know, by the time, like, 2,000 steps, in the largest entity that succeed, successfully replicated it went up to 40 particles. They are working together to replicate. Okay? <clears throat> and this is the average. Average size of the replicating entities. It starts from one, two, but it goes up, and then it keeps gradually going up and up and up. So that means that the relevant scale of replicators is gradually increasing. So why is this happening if we are simply using hash function? So this is the illustrative example. Uh, you can consider horizontal axis is kind of the arbitrary type axis, <coughs> then uh, the vertical axis is the fittest value. Because it's a, a hash function, even at the in individual level, it can go fairly high. But here, this is the distribution of hash values, fitness, if you consider only one particle. If you consider pairs of particles, it gets denser. Chances are that the you know, two-particle combination might be able to find a slightly better fitness values. Three particles together, it's getting even denser. So this way, the evolution might discover over time the more and more higher order structures that could potentially hit the higher fitness value. So that's why the relevant size is gradually increasing. It's a really a minor optimization, but it's still going on. So the most uh, interesting figure that made me happy is this. So this is the plot showing the number of new individual, sorry, cumulative uh, types of the individual particles that appeared in this system. There were mutations in field use, so, but over time, uh, the number of particles that appeared in the system you know, reaches the maximum values. I think this, in this case, the, the size of the original base set S was 1,000. So quickly, the evolution finds all the particles and then saturates. <coughs> but if you plot the number of types of the self-replicating higher order units, it actually goes linearly. So as time goes on, the, uh, by chance, the mutation and also the spatial movement continuously discovers the new combinations of particles that successfully replicated by chance, by, by the hash function. So this contrast is, I think, the one of the really toy example of the open-ended evolution. So I got so happy on the day of the deadline of the, to the abstract submission. So, okay, so this is enough. Let's write it up. Submit. Okay. So, conclusion. So, the key idea I want to propose is to consider the higher order entities of the basic individual elements that naturally leads to the cardinality leap, regardless of the original assumptions. And uh, that's easier said than done, but here we propose one particular uh, uh, tan uh, tangible example called the hash chemistry that actually showed, at least at the proof of concept level, that the cardinality leap can actually show the un, at least so far unbounded uh, continuous production of new entities. Thank you very much. Questions? Okay. Yeah. Um, very nice talk. Very interesting. Uh, I, I think what is missing is what that the hash function. Microphone.
Wouldn't it be uh, interesting to to have this kind of scaling up um, by taking the hash functions then as building blocks for a higher level system? So it seems that this is just one transition, but you want to build more and more transitions and then accelerate. Uh, I guess uh, you know the information I need. Is how do you define transition in this case? So in this case, there is no transition at all, right? Well, you spoke I mean, of a leap. Yeah, leap, leap was actually, yes, yeah, leap was already there. So I'm not talking about, you know, so here I'm actually contradicting with Howard Patti, okay? <laughs> All right, so what I showed here was that the system itself is already open-ended from the beginning, as I said, right? So, and uh, there is no transition. Uh, evolution is always taking place at every, you know, level. Single particle, two particles, it's always there. There is always a chance that any higher order entity can be picked up. So, in that sense, I don't think this is a clear example of transition. I'm not sure if that addresses your question, though. Yeah. So, you, I, I, now I see. You are talking about a multi-set old multi-set. Okay, got it. Yes, that can be done. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> My question is, would you need... Uh, what do you think? Would you need a higher cardinality than the cardinality of the continuum? Oh, no, no, no. The, the continu continuous value of cardinality is already the maximum in this case. What I said was that if the original set S was countable, countably finite or countably infinite, by considering the multi-set, it's going to go up. And this is actually the bigger than the, the power set. The power set is simply the, the set. Multi -set, as you know, Wolfgang knows it very well. Multi-set is easier to cause the, the a slightly bigger transition. And of course, this original set is already continuous. There's nothing we can do. Well, as far as I know. But do we have mathematicians here? Uh, you can go higher. Yeah, you can go higher, of course. I know, uh, you can go higher, yes. But we are not considering that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you described the fitness landscape as being sort of static, but uh, in, in general, the fitness of an uh, individual depends on its environment and it's the biggest part of the environment is the other exactly. living organisms. Yes. So uh, any change to the surrounding organisms changes the fitness landscape. Yeah, that, and it seems yeah. to me if you put that in your model you get a, yeah. a, an even greater explosion in yeah. possibilities. Yeah. I definitely agree that the other individuals should affect in, uh, fitness and then this is the great moment when it's coming back to our philosophy, right? It's already here. In, in a very implicit way. Instead of the considering the explicit interaction between en uh, entities, I cram everything into the hash function. So if you look at only one individual, this is the fitness landscape. If you consider two of them, sorry, two of them, it looks like this, and three of them, it looks like this. So this already implicitly representing the interactions that has been the topic uh, a, a couple of times in this workshop as well, right? So. Uh, instead of looking at the inter interaction between organisms, we can just throw it away and then they ask the you know, universal evaluation machine uh, to take care of it. So the answer is that it's already there, but interpretation is on our side because there is no data structure for that. Uh, this is a little bit technical, but am I understanding right that you're sort of picking a random number and saying go for a three triplet this time, go for a, so that even if I am a well-adapted set of five, they still have to survive as individuals as exactly. well. Exactly. Like my, my, my pinky is getting evaluated all by itself. Exactly. Okay, yes. all right. Yeah. So it would be nice if there was some way yeah. to let that emerge as well. Yes, so that means that there is actually the metal level adaptation going on here, right? Yeah. Even if this particular three triplets is adapted, there's a chance that the god actually choose one of them, and then if they are weak, it's going to kill. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I get what you're saying about the individuals interacting with that, but um, and that increased density. But what if your individuals were already functioning on different intrinsic scales? So they already had different densities in the first place. Do you think that's wrapped up in here, or do you think that would change 
at least the rate of density changing to general multi sets. What, what do you mean with the density? So, um, if you've got individuals interacting, but those individuals are actually already, one of them is an individual as you start here, but the other one is already a multi set. Uh, so, if you had two types of individuals in your system, one of them was already intrinsically. So, uh, humans interacting with atoms. Yeah. Atoms. Right. So, do you think that's already folded into this, or no, do you think no. you've got to. Yeah, in this case, that? Uh, the, the system is so stupidly simple that mm -hmm. you know, even if, the, you know, as Dave mentioned, this particular triplet would like to behave as a triplet, no one can protect them from mm -hmm. keeping that structure. So uh, everything is based on just randomly picking one location that take the subset of the local you know, clusters in the local area. So right now, this model does not have the self-preserving mechanism. Having said that, the evolution may actually discover robust combination that could work at any level, one particle mm -hmm. level, two particle level, three particle level, blah, blah, blah. If mm -hmm. the fact there is a region in the hash function that actually satisfies such kind of simultaneous requirement, eventually they are going to be the winner, which is what we saw in the real simulation. Gradually, you know, yeah. certain types are re-dominating. That's actually what's happening. So, um, one more question. Yeah, I'm, I think the hard problem for our artificial chemistry systems is, uh, what I call God's cookbook, which says when you put these molecules together anywhere in the universe, you get new matter with new properties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems to me you're finessing the whole thing exactly with a hash function. That's why I said I disqualify myself as a modeler. <laughs> you know, two hydrogens and an oxygen make water, yeah. and we don't know why, and when I talk to chemists, they give me a song and dance about how you have to go down to the quantum level, yeah, yeah. and we can't do more than a yeah. deuterium atom. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's still for us, and until we come up with alternative uh, computational models which can predict new matter with new properties, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it seems like we're just dancing with the dynamics and not really getting anywhere. Yes. <laughs> That's my point. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>